All right, starting again in three, two, one. Hello, and welcome to the James McDuffie Podcast. This is episode one, and it is February 2020. So welcome to the new year. Uh, just like a lot of other people out there, I'm trying to follow a New Year's resolution, which is to finally start my podcast and try to get in touch with the rest of the world. My primary motivation for this podcast is really... There's a lot of negativity out there and a lot of misinformation. And so I really thought that being able to share a lot of the different perspectives that I've been learning about um, might help you to have a more positive spin on the world around you uh, and might have you making positive improvements in your life. So I have tried over the years to pick one or two things every single year to get better at. And this year, it's podcasting, it's public speaking, it's impacting the world around me, and hopefully doing so in the most positive way that I can. So, welcome to my podcast. Hopefully, this is the start of a wondrous journey. And let's dig right into our first topic. I plan on having probably quite a few cuts in this video. I'm really just trying to learn my equipment and my lighting, and uh, I got my notes up here so I can make sure that I stay on topic. Um, and I really need to make sure that I am speaking without a lot of ums and likes and all those kind of things. So hopefully I can do very well and uh, you enjoy what you see. I would also like to go and try to record some B-roll and overlay that over the discussion. That way it's not just you staring at me the entire time and being very bored with what I look like. Or if those of you that are listening to my podcast, hopefully my voice doesn't get too monotone after a while. We'll see. We'll play around with it over the next couple episodes and try to really get a feel for uh, what this, is, this format's going to turn out into be. Um, but I'd like to at some point, especially very soon, to start getting some interviews and some other people to actually have a discourse and a discussion on a lot of these really crazy and cool topics. So if you are interested in one of my topics and you want to reach out to me, I will make sure that I include uh, my email address for my business down below and you can reach out to me on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or YouTube or any of those social media outlets and uh, let's set something up because I would like to have more in-depth scientific discussions around this stuff. Uh, a lot of the conversation that I'm starting with is really from the basis of a lot of the books and the online research that I've done as well as talking to several individuals. A um, little quick snip about my background. So I grew up in the Bay Area, uh, California kid. Went to college in Napa Valley. Not yeah. Went to college in Napa, Napa Valley. Uh, got my uh, bachelor's in computer science, and started working inside the industrial space. So uh, I work with industrial-based systems uh, and the computer systems that run them and manage them and uh, do diagnostics on them. And so I'm a very technical, details-oriented type of person, and I also like learning. One of the big things I think is interesting about the computer science industry is it's all about continuously learning because technology constantly moves. And if technology constantly moves, you're forced to constantly improve yourself and to constantly focus on learning new information. But I don't really try to limit my information around my field. There's a lot of other topics that I find fascinating. Anti-aging, today's video being one of them. I also like uh, physics and a lot of science, in-depth science types of topics. Hopefully we'll get to those in the future. I do like a couple political topics, so be warned that this is not going to be a politically neutral podcast. Um, I like to consider myself a moderate, so hopefully we'll hit both the right and the left angles and we'll bring it into a more pictured focus. Uh, the main reason I like this format is you can have long format discussions and really dive into both sides rather than a quick quip on what someone's perspective is because there's a lot of nuance and there usually is no solid black and white and that's the world around us. So with that, again, welcome to my podcast. Thank you for joining me and uh, let's dive into anti-aging, shall we? So uh, what does anti-aging mean for all of us? Uh, what does it mean for me and my family and uh, my relatives? Um, my grandmother right now is starting to experience memory loss, uh, most of it short term. You can sit there and have a long conversation with her about her past. 
But if it's anything short term in terms of like the number of kids I have, uh, sometimes she can ask me four or five times. And so living with that type of an experience where you have someone that's starting to go through these old age um, type of physiological changes and, 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 and mental changes, it, it really makes you wonder what you're going to do or what you can do to make sure that it doesn't impact your own life or, or the other people that you care about. Um, I've been a long-term fitness guy. Uh, I like going to the gym. I like staying fit. I like having a clean diet and being healthy. That doesn't mean that I don't cheat every now and then. I like chocolate and ice cream sandwiches. Uh, those are kind of some of my uh, <laughs> my cruxes in terms of my dieting. Uh, but I typically try to limit that to one day a week to be healthy. And so, you know, I've been following the health industry and the dieting industry for a very, very long time. And hopefully we'll get some podcasts and some videos on those topics. Uh, I think the sugar debate, if you guys have ever uh, watched the video on YouTube, I'd highly recommend it. If you haven't, Sugar the Bitter Truth it kind of adds a lot of the science behind how your body breaks down sugars and where it's processed and how that actually affects you. Uh, I listen to a lot of uh, the natural bodybuilder communities like Jeff Nippard um, and several other people in that space. Scott Herman is another one that comes to mind. Uh, those guys are super fascinating in terms of how you can re -com -com do a, re a body recomposition where you can literally change the entire makeup of your body and understanding that you can do that through diet and exercise. So I've been following these topics for a long time. And then I found a book by a guy named David Sinclair called Lifespans, uh, Aging, or Why We Age and Why We Don't Have To. And I found it absolutely riveting. So if you like science, uh, but you like a very good narrative, uh, I think David Sinclair's book gives you both. And so I'd highly recommend it. So that got me started on the anti-aging kick. And I started digging into a lot of the data and the research, reading a lot of PubMed research articles. And then I uh, ran, my, my wife sent me a Jay Shetty podcast recently that uh, was talking about David Osprey and his book Superhuman and how he, he's the creator of Bulletproof Coffee. He's written several books now and he's done a lot in his life to attack anti-aging. And he had a lot of good experience or bad experiences early in life with obesity and just not being able to, to lose weight and get into shape. And so that kind of kicked started his journey into the whole uh, realm of what it meant to be fit and get into anti-aging stuff. Um, and so his story is really, really fascinating. So I'd recommend both those books. So that's Superhuman by David Osprey, and that is Lifespans, Why We Age and Why We Don't Have To by David Sinclair. But this, this podcast today is really just kind of covering those topics and giving you some uh, knowledge around it. But, but more importantly, I think the purpose of this podcast is to understand that the future is a very positive place, that we have a lot of things to go look forward to, and that it can impact our lives and the lives of those around us. And it's something that we should be aware of so that we can share that knowledge with other people and, and hopefully change the world around us because it is people like us, normal everyday people that change the world around us. And if we can help share the positivity, help share um, the inspiration, I think that, that that brings a life into the joy of the uh, of everybody else around us. Okay, so there's a couple things I specifically want to talk about today around this topic. Um, one is the the key factors that science is currently showing us that has direct influence on how we age and how rapidly we age. I want to get into uh, the near term what that means in terms of how we can apply all this knowledge of science to our own lives over the next several years or potentially the next couple of decades. And then I also want to talk about what the future holds because the future is kind of the cool part. Uh, but we'll save that for a little bit later. I want to get into all of the cool science um, before that. Now, what, is, what does this mean? What does anti-aging mean? There's a lot of people that I talk to that, that are a little nervous about the whole aging thing. I, I remember uh, a girl I knew back in high school that was saying by the time she hit 30, that was it. She's done. She doesn't want to live anywhere past 30 because past 30 sucks. And, and she's right. I mean, I'm past 30 and I got back pains because I had a, uh, you know, 
a bulging disc, I have friends that have other injuries, you get tendonitis in your shoulder or your elbows or your hips, and it's not, it's not a fun, fun place to be the older and older you get. But you learn the things that you can do when you're a kid, you have quick recovery, and the things that you can't do as an adult because your recovery is slower, and you tailor what you do so that you can recover better and enjoy life just as fully as you did when you were younger. And so I think I'm just as healthy now as I am in my 30s, more healthy in some cases, less healthy in others, and it's just that experience. But what this anti-aging stuff really means is looking forward, um, it's not talking about getting to 100 years or 120 years and being decrepit and old and, and losing your hair and not being able to walk and having Alzheimer's or dementia affect your memory. That's not what this anti-aging stuff is about. This anti-aging stuff is really focused about how do you get to 120 and experience life the same way that you did when you were 20 years old. Think about that. If you were 100 years old and you still look 20, and your body still healed like you were 20, why would it matter what age you are? At that point, age is just a number. It becomes irrelevant. Age is no longer valid. That concern about that girl I knew in high school about getting into her 30s and life just sucking completely goes away. It's no longer a valid concern. And so Dr. David Sinclair from the book Lifespans, he talks about it as aging is a disease. And so he really is trying to frame this that it's a disease that humans have just accepted as the norm of life for the last several thousands of years, tens of thousands, millions of years of human existence, and we've, we've just accepted it. Just like we accepted that the average lifespan was the 30s 200 years ago, we accept that 100 years today is an average lifespan, but you look around us and people's lifestyles are changing. You see people today that are in their 80s that look like they're in their 50s. You see people that are in their 60s that barely look like they're out of their 30s. And, but why? Be, some of these people are extreme. Uh, they have extreme diets, they have extreme health plans, they're extreme fitness athletes, but it has an effect. And you can actually witness that, that there are people from 60 to 80 years old today that look like they're in amazing shape. Uh, so, so it allows us to start realizing that age really is just a number. And, and if Dr. Sinclair is correct and it's a disease and we can cure it, then maybe we no longer have to age. And maybe we no longer have to worry about ever getting old ever again. And that, the true fountain of youth, is, is the amazing part. Right? Now, that, that doesn't mean that people aren't going to die, unfortunately. The, the world is, uh, is full of risk. And, and we balance risk in our daily lives every time we get into a car or, or jump onto an airplane. Um, you know, so, so this, we're not talking about people becoming literally immortal. But what we are talking about is biologically immortal. Um, and there are species on this planet, and he points out in his book, and I've read several other research papers, that there are species on this planet that do essentially live forever. There's the immortal jellyfish. There's uh, tree species in the Northern Hemisphere that live for thousands of years. Typically, these trees die out not because they die of old age. They die out, they die out because the climate in which they grew and they, they, they uh, you know, originally, well, uh, the environments in which they seeded and sprouted and uh, became this beautiful, tall, uh, amazing tree changed over the thousand year lifespan that they were there. Maybe it was a forest and a jungle when they originally sprouted and now it's a wasteland and a dry desert. So they dry because of droughts or there's fires or uh, you have diseases that hit trees in those areas. So we're not talking about immortality. We're talking about biological immortality, the ability to for us to refresh our bodies and make sure that we are living healthy. So you're still gonna see car accidents, you're still gonna see uh, cardiovascular disease, you're still gonna see all these other problems uh, that are dietary or risk-related. Um, you know, those guys that are doing wingsuits or squirrel suit diving, uh, skydivers that average lifespan's like two years. Those guys aren't gonna increase their lifespan just because we figure out how to make you biologically live forever. Right? And so the world 
is going to be a different place, but not so much different than we are now. Again, 30, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, people lived till 30. 30 was the average, which means some people lived to their 40s, some people lived to their 50s, but most people were gone by 30, right? So today, most people live in their 80s. And if we're saying that most people are gonna live into their 120s or most people are gonna live into the 150s, then we're just shifting lifespan over time, okay? Um, so that's, that's the interesting thing that we're talking about is really just changing the human experience. And, and as anybody knows, change is inevitable. And change is not bad or good, change is change. And change will always come. Uh, so so let's, let's talk about some of the main key things that, that the scientific community has identified on aging. So the first one is something called cell senescence. Okay, so cell senescence is over time, your body has a way of getting rid of all of its bad cells. So if you have a cell that is no longer doing its job, then it can turn into, at some point, a zombie state. Now, we'll get to the zombie state in a second. The normal response from a healthy human being is that your body triggers some hormones and it identifies that the cell is a bad cell and your body goes up and it cleans up that cell and that cell just gets taken care of, okay? Uh, but if it doesn't clean up that cell, then you have something called a zombie cell or a senescent cell. And the senescent cell, the problem is, is it's not doing its job and it's not what it's supposed to be. And so it causes an inflammation response around the tissue around it. And this inflammation response affects all of the cells that are around that cell that's now becoming inflamed and the body can't get rid of that. And inflammation, there's been a lot of new research that says inflammation itself is worse than most diseases. Inflammation causes half of the problems that you have in your life, whether that's joint pain or cardiovascular issues or brain related uh, injuries um, or, or psychosis. A lot of these things, they're finding out is tied directly to inflammation. So inflammation is really, really bad. The other thing that uh, science is really looking at is the, the realm of epigenetics. And so Dr. Sinclair is an epigeneticist. He works with a lot of labs around the world. And he is a Harvard researcher. And his groups have been researching uh, the whole epigenetic landscape for a number of years now. And the interesting thing is if you asked two or three years ago about what all the symptoms and signs of aging were, you would get all these things like the mitochondria in your cells aren't working very well, or you would say that you have these telomeres at the end of your uh, DNA strands that are getting shorter and shorter and shorter, and so that's like a ticking clock for how many times uh, your, your cells can reproduce themselves. But it turns out through Dr. Davis and Claire's research that these are all symptoms of a single thing that is more upstream. And by upstream, I mean cause and effect. Something happens up here that affects all these other things, right? So you go back to the source or the root cause of the problem. And so epigenetics is a new field. It was, re I mean, it's been around for a long time in terms of theories. It's really been dug into scientifically over the last 10, 10 or 15 years. Um, but what they find is that you have an epigenome and your epigenome sits right next to your, your normal genome. So you have all your chromosomes and you have your, your spindles of DNA and they're all wrapped super tightly. Well, they're wrapped around these, these things that are your epigenome and your epigenome determines which pieces of your DNA the cell is going to read. Now, when you're young, it does a really good job of reading your DNA and unwrapping the part that you're supposed to wrap and then rewrapping it tightly again. Um, but as you age, your epigenome slowly over time stops becoming as effective. Um, now this is because of something called a Waddington marble. We'll get to that in a second, but I really want you to think about the effect of this. So if you're young and you can read your DNA correctly and you can tell the cell what it's supposed to do, then it, you know, the mitochondria work really well. The protein uh, machines of your cell are doing their job correctly because they're given the right instructions. So what happens if you read a little bit too much? Or what happens if you read a little bit too little? Well, this is what we get when we age. So good examples, hair cells. So when you're born, you're born with a hair cell and that cell knows what it's supposed to do. And over time, some people go bald while other people go gray. Well, what's happening here? Well, what's happening is the epigenome over time is losing track of what it is. And by losing track of what it is, it's reading the wrong information and all of a sudden your hair can't grow because it's, it, it doesn't know how to grow hair anymore. That cell in your head doesn't know how to grow hair or the vice versa. Maybe uh, 
it no longer knows how to produce the color in your hair. You still have hair, but it doesn't understand the, the, the color aspects of your hair. Now, these, these are things that we pass down through generations. So our epigenetics are passed down to our children, so they have similar epigenetics to us. So you end up with these whole life cycles of kids, you know, who, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren who had that one bald guy in their family and now they're all bald by the time they hit their 40s, right? And so this is something that, that they've identified. Now, Dr. David Sinclair also talks about the what he calls the information theory of aging. And the concept here is if you take a cell and you take the DNA, the, the chromosomes from an 85 year old person and you clone them, you don't end up with an 85 year old person. In fact, that cell reproduces the epigenetics at what it's supposed to be, which means your epigenetics, even though you copy the same epigenome through every single cell replication, there, there is an original copy of what your epigenetics look like. And so even though as we age, our epigenetics slowly lose information over time, all the information, even on our oldest cells, exists to rewrite our epigenome. So if you find a way to stabilize your epigenome, your hair won't go gray. You won't lose your hair or your skin won't sag or all, you, you know, you, you may not get osteoporosis. All these age related effects may never happen because your cells know what they're supposed to do. Uh, now, now let's back up a little bit. I was talking about something called a Waddington marble. So how does the epigenome know what it's supposed to be? So when you're in your mom's womb, when you're a baby and, and you're growing, you're predominantly stem cells, right? And so these cells get these hormonal triggers, triggers that tell the cells what they're supposed to be. And what that means is the cell grabs the DNA, starts creating the epigenome, and then this thing called a Waddington marble moves down the epigenome and then tags a specific spot. You're a hair cell, you're a skin cell, you're a liver cell, you're an eye cell. Okay, so then it's tagged that epigenome that this is what you're supposed to be forever. Now, the interesting thing is these epigenome, epigenomic bumps that these marbles roll into are different depths. And so if you think about species on this planet that have very short lifespans, they have very flat landscapes. And so they mark what the cell is, but it falls out of that marker really fast, which means these things die really fast because their cells aren't stable enough to keep doing or keep replicating what they are uh, versus you have a human where we have a reasonably good dimple where the marble rolls into that dimple and it says you're going to be a skin cell and right now if you take care of your epigenetics and we'll get into some of those things of how you you protect your epigenetics your skin cell says a skin cell for a very long time or your hair cell says a hair cell for a very long time now there's other species on this planet that uh, they, their cells stay what they're supposed to be for a significantly longer. There's a whale in Norway, um, I think it's Norway, Norwegian whale, I believe, I'd have to double check that, um, but it's supposed to start reproducing, so it starts having, becoming sexually active at 150 years old. Can you imagine if humans couldn't even have kids until you reached 150? Crazy. And this whale supposedly can live up to 300, even older. So you wait 150 years before you can have kids, and then you have another 150 years before you, know, you, you get old and die. And again, there's trees on these planets, and the reason these trees can live for thousands of years is because their epigenetic landscape, it's, it's more like a, a, uh, a canyon where, where the marble rolls into this canyon and it can't get out, which means it's stuck there. It knows what it's supposed to be forever. This is how aging uh, affects affects us is epigenetic stability determines how fast you age and the more instability you have in your epigenome the faster you age now uh, reading a couple of these books and looking at the research the main key factor in all of this in terms of how well you age is this little tiny micro machine this protein machine in in your cells called a sirtuin and co so these sirtuins are these little machines that their job is to maintain your epigenome. So they come over and they're like, hey, Waddington Marble, you're out of place, move back, right? And so they just make sure that your epigenome's doing what it's supposed to do. But they, all, they have two jobs. They're, they're, they're not just there to keep your epigenome stable. What they also do is they're there to make sure that your DNA remains correct, okay? And what that means is Anytime you take DNA damage, they leave the epigenome and they pop over and they're interested in fixing the DNA damage. 
that's there. So a good example is let's say that you're sitting on the beach and you get a sunburn, DNA damage. Let's say that you go through an x-ray machine at an airport, or better yet, you're just riding the plane because you're up at atmosphere and you, you have less protection and you're getting bombarded with cosmic rays, DNA damage. Now, we, we get billions of DNA damage every single day. It's part of normal life. Uh, we live on a planet that has a sun that radiates radiation. It affects us. We can't eliminate it. We can reduce it, but we can't eliminate it. So these sirtuins hop off the epigenome and they go over and they fix the DNA. They're like, oh, that snip clipped together, that snip clipped together, great, that's, that's done. Now, they don't apparently understand the research, they don't always find their way back to the epigenome, right? They can't, they get lost. Why? Because the, the cell has signals to help it find or, you know, protect the epigenome. And these signals, which we'll get into later what actually supposedly triggers these signals, um, but those signals really tell the sirtuins to get back, hey, you gotta go over there and, and take care of your epigenome. And they did some interesting experiments to figure out how this actually works. There are, there's a group of people on the planet that have a rare genetic disease. And this rare genetic disease makes them look like they're 60 when they're 30 years old, okay? It's kind of crazy. They, they look old. And scientists were looking at it, and it turns out that if you take these sirtuins into account, um, what's happening is the sirtuin, these people have a genetic disorder where their DNA breaks all the time. And so because their DNA is breaking all the time, uh, the sirtuins are jumping over to fix the DNA breaks and not taking care of the epigenome. So the epigenome ages really, really fast, which makes these people look really, really old, because the sirtuins are spending all of their time fixing DNA. Now they reproduce this in a lab. And so Dr. Sinclair and his team and a bunch of other people across the, the globe, what they did is they injected a mouse with a, uh, I believe it's something called a DNA precursor. The idea is they could turn on and turn off the breakage of DNA. So they, they found a, D, uh, a certain DNA strand that allowed DNA to break really frequently. They turned it on in mouse and they had a chemical trigger where they could either allow it to break constantly or not break constantly. And then they tracked it and they found out that when they turned it on, uh, the mouse aged significantly faster, which means the sirtuins were spending all the time fixing DNA breaks when it was on and not taking care of the epigenome. And these mice aged significantly faster. Now, the interesting thing about mice is they age very similar to humans. They get gray hair, their ears get really foldy, weird skin, they can get osteoporosis. So a lot of the things that affect mice and the reason they're so good for research is that they're very, very similar to how humans uh, respond to, to a lot of these chemicals and drugs and, and, and uh, we can really effectively see aging in them just like we can see in ourselves. Okay, so, so these sirtuins, these sirtuins are managing the epigenome and they're also managing your DNA breaks. And so the more we do to cause DNA breaks, the faster we age. That's, that's one of the, the big takeaways out of a lot of this research. And so you want to be able to trigger the sirtuins to protect the epigenome so that it does its job better to stabilize the epigenome. But even more interesting is back to that that, that information loss theory that, that Dr. Sinclair had, is if you can rewrite the epigenome, if you could reset the epigenome, you could prevent aging entirely, like completely get rid of aging. If all the signs of aging is because your epigenome loses track of which pieces of your DNA it's supposed to read, if you could find a way to reset it, you could prevent aging entirely. This is the mind blowing part, right? The mind blowing part is we have kind of figured out that the epigenome is responsible for all the downstream effects. And so if the cell isn't reading the right commands, then your telomeres are getting shorter. And if your DNA isn't reading the right commands in, in your source code, which is your DNA, right? Your, your GTCA, and it's not able to, hey, say cells go clean yourself up, then you're getting a lot of extra stuff building up in your cells that's preventing the cell from functioning correctly. And so it really all comes down to two main key pieces of aging is this cell senescence stuff we were talking about earlier and this epigenetic landscape in terms of not being able to repair your epigenome. So you take those two things combined and you say, well, I need to get rid of as much inflammation as I possibly can and I need to stabilize my epigenome as much as I can. If I can do these two things, 
maybe you cure aging. Maybe aging is, is, is no longer a thing for the entire human species. And that's the thing that is truly, truly fascinating. Because if you look at the world healthcare budget today, let's just take a swath of the giant numbers, the billions and billions of dollars that, that Americans and Europeans and every nation, not just, not just first world nations or, or Western nations, but every nation spends on healthcare. It's astronomical. Now, when you look at the numbers, the last number I heard, don't quote me on this. I need to go, I, we can go look it up uh, maybe in another podcast, but it's, it's somewhere like 80 to 90% of all Medicare costs, med medical costs are specific around older age individuals. Also, if you look at it, most older age individuals, age is related to cardiovascular disease, it's related to Alzheimer's disease, it's related to cancer rates. And so when you hit 50, all of your percentage, all your, all your chances, all your risks for accumulating any of these end of life diseases skyrocket. So what we're talking about is not just improving the quality of life in the future, we're talking about reducing the medical costs for the entire society. We're talking about reducing the standard causes of death across all of society and just making life better, right, for everybody. Now this isn't gonna get rid of rid of uh, these diseases entirely. There's, there's people that are far younger than their 50s that experience cancer, that experience a cardiovascular disease, uh, or, or a lot of the metabolic syndromes. A lot of those are dietary related. Uh, so those aren't going to be cured by, by this type of research. But the mass majority <coughs> of the problems we see in life could could be affected by this and drastically affected by this. Okay, so that is kind of the science behind it all. Uh, we've talked about cell senescence and we talked about the epigenome. Um, so I do want to talk about the future, but let, let's let's talk about more about the things that you can do now. And and let's talk a little bit about those sirtuins. Okay, so there are chemical signals in the body that allow these sirtuins to do their job better. And the research right now is showing that the, there's three primary things that can affect what these sirtuins do. Well, there's four, really. We'll, but but the, the first three are non-supplemental. They're things, they're behaviors that you and I and everybody else can start doing to affect how we age. And how we age is, is super impactful for our daily lives because if we're aging slower and our epigenome is more stable, we have less inflammation, we have less pains, you know, we're waking up feeling better, we have more energy. So all these things are super important, okay? So the, the first piece is, it turns out that fasting, when your body is in a fasted state, it is a triggering mechanism for these sirtuins to lock down the cell and protect the epigenome. So it literally says, you're no longer gonna replicate, we're gonna lock you down, and we're gonna make sure that the epigenome is 100% safe so that it can continue to do its job well. Now, there's a lot of different types of fasting. I personally do intermittent fasting. I will typically skip breakfast in the morning, just have a cup of black coffee, uh, go and skip lunch, maybe three, four days a week, and then have a solid dinner. It's, it's, it's good for a number of reasons. One, you tend to eat better in the one or two meals that you're actually eating a day, in a day. And two, it teaches you that you don't have to have the modern American lifestyle of eat all the time. But third, the biggest benefit is the fact that it prevents you from aging. There's actually a lot of other benefits for intermittent fasting based on the research. Uh, one of the things is the human body cannot clean up itself. So there's this process in the human body where it cleans up a lot of these senescent cells, by the way, uh, and that's called autophagy. There's a guy in Japan who won the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago for discovering how autophagy works. And one of the main key triggering factors that they found is if you don't, if you want autophagy to start triggering in your body, you can't have protein for a minimum of 12 hours. So you think about that. Uh, if I if I eat dinner at seven, and then I uh, sleep for eight hours and go to bed at 10, right? So that's three plus eight is 11. So that's 11 hours. And then I skip breakfast. 
Okay, so I wake up at eight and then I eat lunch at noon. So that's four additional hours. All of a sudden that puts me at 14, 15 hours, right? Just even just skipping breakfast. So eating dinner, skipping breakfast, eating lunch. So that over 12 hours gives my body a, a couple hour window to, to clean up all of the problems that are kind of running around in my cells. So again, there's, there's huge benefits to fasting. Intermittent fasting, that doesn't mean starve. That doesn't mean don't eat every day. You're eating every day. You're just finding that you can skip breakfast. And it doesn't necessarily change your calories. You can eat a 2000 calorie diet or a standard healthy diet while intermittent fasting. It's just you're bunching all of your eating into a few couple hours. All right, and we can, we can talk more about that in a future podcast if, if people are really interested. Um, but you think about it, it helps with autophagy, so it cleans up a lot of those senescent cells, uh, and it also triggers your sirtuins to come in and take care of your epigenome. So your epigenome is stable and it allows you to age much more slower. So there, there's huge benefits in that. Uh, one of the other things that a lot of the current research is showing is that antioxidants, all these things that we get from blueberries and the phytonutrients that we get from uh, foods that are have have a lot of bright colors. A lot of bright colors are your, you know, your foods with phytonutrients. So if you think about like eggplants or bell peppers or uh, strawberries or blueberries, all these things have really high antioxidants. Uh, it's interesting because there's different sides of the research. So some people believe that the antioxidants help the oxidation in your blood and, and it prevents things from uh, getting worse over time. But Dr. David Sinclair's research and a couple of his, his medical groups have actually noted that these are small toxins. They're, they're, they're toxins that don't hurt your body, but they, they are toxins that trigger a cellular response. And that cellular response is that by eating all these foods super high in these antioxidants and, and phytonutrients, it triggers the cells to, again, go into lockdown mode and protect the epigenome. So what you eat really does matter at a genetic level. It's not just your cardiovascular system. It's not just your, your lipid system. It's, 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 it's everything down to every single cell potentially cares about what you're putting into your body, right? And, and that's, that's a really important note of things that you can do now to, to have a direct effect. The other, the other, another interesting thing that the research is showing is that the hormones that get triggered for uh, fight or flight or exhaustion and exercise uh, have a direct effect on your epigenome. And so these sirtuins also respond to chemical responses to you exercising. So if you're running around and getting winded and getting out of breath two or three times a week, those are also epigenetic signals that you can control through your own behavior to keep your epigenome stable. So it triggers the sirtuins. So let's go over that again. Um, the things that you can do today that can allow you to take care of your epigenome as well as getting rid of senescent cells uh, are, are very simple, right? It's having a healthy diet. It's intermittent fasting. Now, whether you want to do alternate day fasting or you want to do once or two, one or two times a week, whatever works for you. Uh, everybody responds to fasting differently. I found that fasting works really well for me. Uh, there's a lot of literature on a whole bunch of other benefits in terms of mental clarity. Um, and back to the autophagy thing, it, it allows you to clean up all these senescent cells. So what you eat, when you eat, second most important thing. Um, and then last but not least, getting exercise is huge. Those three things are super huge in terms of how you age and how well you age over time. So when you decide to get out of bed and go get a cheeseburger and not go to the gym for that day, you are choosing to age faster is really what it means. When you decide that you're hungry and you're gonna go to In-N-Out and order that huge shake, you're making the decision, your choice, that you wanna age faster. And there's, there's ramifications of that and age-related ramifications. There's people that look substantially older. Another, another good example based on the conversation around sirtuins, right, is DNA damage. People that smoke heavily, the reason they look older. Now, don't get me wrong, some people have weird genetic anomalies and they don't seem to age and smoking doesn't give them cancer. Those people are weird, right? They're not normal people. Um, but 
What that means is most people that are smoking cigarettes all the time, all the chemicals that they have cause massive DNA damage. And that the sirtuins are away from the epigenome, fixing the DNA damage, allowing those people that are smoking to age prematurely, which means the more you smoke, the faster you age. The more radiation you get, the more sunburns you get in your life, the faster you age. Uh, the more unhealthy food you eat in your life, the faster you age. The less exercise you get, the faster you age. So it's in our benefit to pick these habits in our daily lives that allow us to have higher quality lives for longer periods of time and experience the advancement of aging at a much slower rate than everybody else around us. Okay, so that's that's the kind of the first thing that we can do. It's it's <laughs> the same old adage: you eat healthy, you live healthy. Um, you know, you you work out, you stay healthy, stay active. It, it all has direct impacts on on how we are, and we we know this. There's there's not just scientific evidence, but anecdotal evidence where you look at the people around you that follow these types of practices, and they are definitely healthier and more active and their lives are far more fulfilled than, than some of the rest of us. So that's something that we should really take into consideration. Okay, so the other thing that uh, Dr. Davidson Keller really talks about is that at a cellular level, there's this thing called NAD. So NAD is a certain type of uh, nucleotide chemicals that allows your sirtuins to work more effectively, okay? And the interesting thing is based on studies, the NAD levels when you're a kid are super, super high. Whereas as you age, the, they, they curtail off. So the body, when you're young, before you have kids and reproduce, says, hey, I need to keep this individual alive as long as I can. I'm going to let my cells work really, really effectively. So it produces a lot more NAD and your body just repairs itself significantly better. This is part of the reason why when you're in your 20s, you can reco recover from an injury very easily. Versus when you get into your 30s, it's harder. And your 40s, substantially harder because your cells just aren't being as effective as they used to be. Okay, and so uh, David Sinclair was on the Joe Rogan show and he was discussing, Joe Rogan made the comment, well, why can't you just you know, intravenously pop in an NAD uh, serum and just pump it through your blood? And Dr. David Sinclair had the conversation of, well, the molecules are actually too big to get into your cells. And so just by you taking NAD doesn't allow you to boost your NAD inside of your cells. And so what he suggests and what other people in the industry suggest is that there are the supplements you can take that are precursors to NAD and what they find is if you you up the bioavailability of these precursors the cells actually start producing more NAD at an intercellular level and so there's a couple of these that we can talk about uh, in, in a little bit that will allow you to boost your natural NAD levels and allow your sirtuins to work more effectively. Now, does that mean don't care about, just, just take the supplement and don't worry about exercise and diet? No, of course not. Uh, you still need the other signals to tell your sirtuins to protect your epigenome. This just allows the sirtuins and other things in your cell to work more effectively um, at keeping your epigenome and your DNA significantly in better shape, okay? And so those are called NAD boosters. There's a whole slew of them on the market right now. Uh, and those are the types of things uh, that you could do supplementation wise, in addition to healthy diet and exercise that could potentially allow you to age much more slower. Now that doesn't prevent aging. It, it definitely, this isn't an anti, it's, it's anti-aging from the fact that it slows aging down. It's not anti-aging from the fact that you're not gonna age. The, these aren't like reset buttons, okay? Um, and we'll get to that in a minute because there is one of the future things I want to talk about is there is a potential reset button in the future, which is absolutely fascinating. Uh, the other thing is in terms of the cell senescence inflammation stuff that I was talking about earlier, there are ways to clean up senescent cells. In fact, there's a couple drugs on the market right now that are very, very promising and there's a lot of research around. One, one of them specifically is metformin. So metformin is a uh, diabe diabetes drug and there's a lot of people taking it right now. But the interesting thing about metformin is it seems to clean up senescent cells really, really well. It decreases inflammation. And based, based on what I said earlier, inflammation is one of the great enemies about getting older, is the older you get, the more inflammation you have, the, the less effective a lot of your cells and, and, and components in your body work. So getting rid of these senescent cells as you age is very, very important. And 
so metformin is one of them. There's a bunch of research that goes into rapamycin. There's a history with rapamycin, I believe, where earlier versions of it caused actual larger problems, but now uh, they're, they're finding that in small quantities and really controlled studies that, that there's some really good effects out of it. There's also a couple supplements that you can take that could potentially help with cell senescence. And that is uh, fisetin and quercetin are supposedly their uh, again, bioavailability on precursors to allow your body to do a better job of finding the zombie cells and finding these senescent cells and allowing your natural immune response, your na natural cleanup systems of your body to target those cells and get rid of them, okay? So in addition to fasting, diet, exercise, et cetera, those are some of the things you can do. You can, you can think about supplementation. Uh, they're not crazy expensive. You can buy most of this stuff on Amazon or you can, um, you can uh, really just take care of a healthy diet. It's really one of my preferences. Uh, back to epigenetics, let's go to the, back to the NAD booster a little bit, is the, the, the precursors that I was talking about. One of them is called NR, and the other one is called NMN. Not MNN, MNMs, right? NMN, uh, Nevada Mike Nevada. Uh, you can get these supplements, again, on Amazon. There a lot of people have them. And there's a couple companies out there that are starting to make some blends that kind of pair up cell senescence types of chemicals with, or, or, or supplements with these uh, NAD boosters. So if you have cell senescence and you get rid of it and you get rid of inflammation and you have these NAD boosters, then those combined have a greater effect. Now, again, those are just helping your natural body systems to do better and you want through diet and exercise to, to really do the main portion of that. These are just boosters. Okay, so, so that kind of covers that. So what, is, what, what, what do we see that as giving us in, in the short term? So there's some crazy science that I wanna get to in a minute, but what does that give us in the short term? Well, it means that most of us will probably see the maximum longevity of the human lifespan. We'll probably see more centennials. And in fact, we already are. We're seeing a lot more people around the world uh, live for significantly longer. And there's rumors of people even to live, even living into their 140s. So if you can hit your 100s and be substantially in better health and you can live into your 120s, 130s, and potentially your 140s, I really see that this basic supplementation and the more focus on restrictive dieting, healthy eating and uh, you know a, a good good lifestyle of exercise allowing more and more groups of people to live for far longer times but how do we break break that barrier it seems like there definitely is a barrier about 120 125 that that most people on this planet just never break right it's, it seems very hard to break past 120 years well so now we're going to go into some of the other stuff that Dr. Sinclair was really talking about. And a few years ago, there's this guy named Yamanaka, and he's a researcher from Japan. And he figured out how to take adult cells and transform them into stem cells. Now, stem cells are what you would call a non-cell. So when you're born in your mom's womb, there's a lot of stem cells and they're getting told what they're going to become. You remember back in the 90s, there's a lot of controversy about the only way you could get stem cells was scraping placentas, uh, you know, after after babies were born and people were really, or from abortions, people really didn't like getting stem cells from that way. So there's a huge political controversy around all of that. But nowadays, with with what this guy Yamanaka figured out, you can take any cell in the body and inject these four uh, tags these Yamanaka factors, and you can convert that back into a non-cell. Now that's cool. Uh, if you can convert it back into a, a, a baby cell, maybe you can improve health regeneration. We find that injecting stem cells into bad joints, into uh, bad tissue, that that helps substantially increase the repair of, of things in your body that aren't going well, right? There's a lot of research that if you have a bad joint, you inject stem cells, you know, two years later, your joint is 100% repaired because your body used those stem cells to repair the cellular damage that you had in those tissues. And so they did some experiments where they took a bunch of mice and they injected all four Yamanaka factors. And originally the results were quite impressive. 
The problem with that is when you turn most of the cells in a mouse into stem cells, they become non-cells. And as if, if you don't know, when you have cells in your body that don't know what they're supposed to do, that's called a tumor. And so if you have a mouse with way too many stem cells and not enough known cells, then these mice ended up dying from huge tumor formation. Well, that's not really what we want. We, we want to be able to improve health and improve viability and improve the ability of the body to repair itself, but we don't necessarily want to reset all the cells in the body back to zero. So, uh, interestingly enough, just this last year, a couple researchers out of Harvard uh, were playing around with this whole uh, Yamanaka factors, and one of the brilliant researchers, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to tag his name down in one of the descriptions, because he, he should really get credit for, for figuring this stuff out. He, he figured out that one of the four Yamanaka factors was, was pro the thing that took it back from a good cell to a non-cell. So you had an old cell that would go back to what the cell's supposed to be, and then the last Yamanaka factor pushed it all the way back to being a non-cell. So if you could turn that off, you could turn the rest of the cell back to being a good cell, not a stem cell, and then essentially reset the entire cell's mechanism. You could reset your genetics to be what the factory specification is, if you think about it. So here's, I want you to pause for a second. What is a human supposed to be at his most perfect state? He or she, right? Um, well, your genetics have this blueprint, and so you're, in your, you're, you're born, you're a baby, you grow up, every six to seven years, all the cells in your body recycle themselves. So you have a newborn, a seven-year-old, a 14-year-old, 21 year old, a 28 year old, somewhere before between 21 and 28, you're your blueprint. That's what you're supposed to be, whatever that blueprint is. That, that's, that's what your body over the last 20 some years was trying, was reading out of your genetics. This is what you are, okay? Now, after that, you're done. That's you. You're, you're 25. We'll just pick a number right in the middle of 20 and 30. You're, you're 25. And then your epigenome loses track of who you're supposed to be over time, and then you get to 40 and you're old. Well, maybe we're not all old when you're 40, but, uh, or you get to 60 or 70 or 80, and you know, you're, you're getting really, really old. So if you can reset the cell, guess where you're going to reset it to? You're going to reset it to that 25 year, to 25 year old. And so they did this in an actual lab. So the way they did it is they took a retrovirus, and then they took this cool thing called CRISPR. So CRISPR is this new genetic tool that they figured out comes from bacteria that can snip DNA. And it can be very specific. They can say, I want this GTCA snipped, insert this instead. So it has given biologists and gene ge genologist? genologists the ability to make very precise edits to these uh, DNA strands. And so they take this retrovirus that has the CRISPR in it, which is this bacterial stuff, and they program it so that they know what they're actually changing so they can turn on the Yamanaka factors, and then they inject it into this mouse and they infect the entire mouse. And so this mouse is infected by this retrovirus, and what that does is it takes CRISPR and it triggers it to go infect every single cell and change the DNA in every single cell every cell gets changed. And so they took this three-year-old mouse, mouse, which is the equivalent of an 85-year-old person, and what did that do? It converted it back into a 20-year-old human relative. I think it's like six months, uh, a mouse that's like six months old, right? Or something like that. And, and, and this is now starting to be the longest lived mouse on the planet. They, they got a couple more years and a bunch more research to go figure it out. It's not, it's not happening today. But they can literally, through the Yamanaka factors, through CRISPR, through using a retrovirus, they can take your cells and my cells and everybody's cells and say, ready, set, hard reset. You're 20 again. Whew. I mean, you, you, you want to talk about changing life as we know it for the better. And for all the reasons that we talked about earlier, which is the cost of healthcare or the experience of getting old or you know, just, just all the side effects like my grandmother and losing her memory, all of those things being fixed like that. It's crazy. It, it, it's something 
really, truly miraculous that, that we should want for every single human on this planet, to take away that pain, to take away that suffering, to really change what it means to be human, that's life-changing. And that's what the future holds. So, so all of a sudden, we're no longer talking about living to 150. We're not talking about living to 180. Maybe we're talking about living to 200. Maybe we're talking about living to 1,000. So, so, so again, this science is really, really new. Um, it's all in the lab. It's all been a lot of the craziest discoveries have only been over the last couple of years. Uh, so what you probably have is another 10 years in an actual lab doing hard research. And then you have another 10 years of human trials and testing to make sure that it's safe for the general population. And then, you know, I'm almost 40. So by the time I get to 60, pop a pill, turn on some genetics, boom, I'm back into my 20s. And we can potentially live for a lot longer with a lot higher quality levels of life, far superior than what our aged communities live today. And so that's what Dr. David Sinclair means by, by aging as a disease. We know the cause of it and we can reverse the cause of it and potentially, potentially follow that Norwegian whale or follow what the trees do and change our epigenetic landscapes going forward in, in the next several decades to make it so that maybe we don't have to t turn this on and off. Maybe we don't need the Yamanaka factors. Maybe we just change our epigenome for all of our children. And you know, we change the human lifespans to be thousands of years. But why is this important? Why is this inspirational? Why is this powerful? Well, it's, it's, it's more than just living longer with higher quality of life or a higher quality of life. Think about traveling to the stars. Right now, traveling to our nearest star, Alpha Centauri, is, is more than a human lifespan away. More than a human lifespan away. If you can change that, if you can make it well within a human lifespan, we can actually talk about colonizing the stars. We can actually talk about moving to other planets. It, it opens up the entire universe for the human species to go look at what our future actually means. It's, it's so much more than just changing us uh, to live a couple more years. It's, it's really opening the possibilities uh, for every single you know, child's fantasy on science fiction is to explore the universe and, and to go see things that we never thought were possible. Okay, so uh, there's concerns. This concerns that people have, right? So some of the biggest concerns is uh, overpopulation, that the, the earth is gonna be overpopulated by these people that live far too long. And the other biggest concern is that only rich people are gonna have access to this type of technology. Uh, well, I tend to disagree with both of those. And there's research out there that backs up those claims that uh, we're not gonna get overpopulated if this happens. And there's research that backs up that, well, not research, maybe anecdotal, but there's, there's plenty of evidence out there that suggests that the rich aren't gonna be the only ones that are gonna access to this. Uh, there's a documentary on Netflix and it talks about how there's this huge new swelling in the biohacker community. What are biohackers? If you've never uh, heard the term, a biohacker is someone that changes his external or internal environments to affect his biology. And these specific biohackers, their goal is to take things like CRISPR and rewrite their own genetics. There's people that are trying it with dog breeds so they can genetically remove the problems in some of our dogs. So a good example is hip dysplasia in Labradors, or is it German Shepherds, in, in some species of dogs. Um, how do you get rid of that? Can you genetically just remove it? Some dogs are prone to certain types of cancer. Can you just fix the genetics so that they're not prone to those types of cancer? And if you can do that, then you can edit the human genome even more specifically than just around aging. Think about it. There's huge groups of people right now that are actually talking about editing human genetics while you're a living creature. There was this kid back east who had this degenerative eye disease. It's in the Netflix documentary. Totally recommend going to see that. Uh, I'll also try to find the link to that and, and put the title in the description below. Uh, but he couldn't see. And so he had this 100,000, 200,000 crazy expensive procedure where they injected the CRISPR virus in the back of his eye with these genetic edits. And within a couple of weeks, the kid had perfect 2020 vision. But think about that. We're just not talking about curing genetic diseases. What if somebody has blue eyes and they want brown eyes? 
fixed. What if somebody has uh, pale skin and they want dark skin or dark skin and they want pale skin? Fixed. All you gotta do is go and get a, go to Amazon, order a genetic kit for blue eyes, and the next thing you know, you're gonna have blue eyes. I mean, you're, you're talking about changing all of humanity as we know it. And if you're talking about where this is going to first impact the super rich, I'm sure, the, the rich are doing things now for anti-aging that us normal people can't even afford. Um, but at some point, that's going to become normal technology everyone's gonna have access to it. You, me, my kids, my grandkids, you know, relatives, uh, people in the po poorest parts of the planet. If you can go and just buy a syringe and inject yourself and you're done, guess what? Congratulations, you now live for another 200 years. Or, hey, I'm gonna inject myself and now I change my eye color or my hair color or my skin color or, or maybe I'll grow two inches. I don't know, it could be crazy, right? All these things could be totally feasible within the realm. So I don't think it's gonna be limited to the super rich. I think there's far too much evidence that says that normal people are gonna have access to these technologies and that they're gonna be so widely available that we really don't have to worry about it. Now, are there problems with that? Yeah, absolutely. You're talking about massive amounts of humanity changing their genetics and you're gonna see a very different gene pool than what we've seen before. Uh, but there's this other guy on YouTube that I'd recommend um, I can't remember his name, but he talks about all the genealogies and he's talking about how North America is starting to become a, a blend of a lot of different types of, of, of uh, genes. So he talks about how you have humans that are separated into different parts of the world for tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, and that's how you have very unique genetic features in those areas. But if you trace them all back to Africa and to uh, Central Asia, and, and, and Europe, most of the DNA that makes us human is, is identical. It's all mostly the same, right? So it doesn't matter where you're from, almost all humans are identical other than a few key genetic tags that make you look different. So if we're talking about just changing those genetic tags that make us look different, then dude, I'm all for it. You're giving people the opportunity to decide who they wanna be despite um, where they're born or, or, or what they look like at the, at the time of their, their inception. Talk about true control of your destiny. I think that's that's a fascinating concept. Uh, but that we can save more for another episode. Back to the overpopulation issue. Uh, one of the interesting things is you go back 10 years, 15 years, people were super, super concerned about overpopulation because you had these huge spikes in the 60s, 70s, and 80s of larger and larger populations where people were having more and more kids and people weren't dying. So if you go back to the early 1900s, 1800s, you, you needed 15 kids because out of 15 kids, there was huge death rates. The, the likelihood of your, your sibling dying was astronomical. And so death was a normal part of life. Whereas today, most of us live long and happy lives. So we don't have to worry about um, you know, losing brothers and losing sisters and, 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 and losing friends just to these random, uh, you know, hey, somebody got the flu and five people died yesterday uh, type of thing. It's, it's, it's much, much less common. But because of that, because you came from a world where everybody was always dying and you came to a world where they figured out how to prevent a lot of that death, population sort, and it's taken us, you know, 50 years to really readjust how many kids people want to have. And what you're seeing right now is if you go look at Japan or you look at uh, Germany, or you even look at the United States, we're curving our population growth. Our, our population growth, we actually are starting to have a negative population growth, which means this is going to follow suit in most of the other countries. Now there's things that have impacted this, right? Uh, I think health is a big one. Um, I think education is another big one. I think the fact that we have uh, technologies that have allowed uh, women to have equal, more equality in the workforce uh, in terms of like birth control and uh, feminine hygiene products that have allowed them to have true equality in the workforce. Um, this has allowed them to have careers and uh, you know, build their lives however they want and having more freedom to do so. And that freedom has made a lot of women choose to start families significantly later. And so I have several friends of mine right now that this is anecdotal, but the numbers can actually, you know, back this up, is that, uh, you know, most people don't want kids or they want one kid or they want to wait till way later to have kids, wait till their 40s before they have kids. Um, 
So the world is changing. And I don't think that giving people longer lifespans is going to have a direct impact on our population concerns for the world. Because if all the populations are going down, maybe the best way to combat that population is by giving people longer lives and better lives. Anyways, so uh, I hope you're as fascinated with the future as I am. Those books again, uh, David Osprey, Superhuman, absolutely fantastic book. Uh, he talks about all the different things related to aging. He talks about cell senescence. He talks about uh, gut bacteria causing inflammation. Really high, highly recommend his book. Also, uh, there's David Sinclair with Lifespans, Why We Age and Why We Don't Have To. That's, um, man, that, that really opened my eyes to a whole different world, which is predominantly the reason for this specific video and uh, podcast. Anyways, uh, thank you for joining me today. It's been a wonderful experience for me. I hope you learned something and were inspired. And uh, we'll do another video next time. Thanks for joining us. My name is James McDuffie, and this is the James McDuffie Podcast.